Bike Shop Radio is a podcast that originates from 718 Cyclery in Brooklyn, New York. My name is Joe Nosella, former architect and owner of 718 Cyclery. We will discuss modern retail trends, the bike industry, and life in and around our vibrant shop. We focus on content and interest, not recording technology and slick editing. Our stories might happen in our loud shop, on the louder streets of Brooklyn, or out in the country on a bike camping trip. There might be sirens or Van Halen in the background, so be prepared. Thank you for taking the time to listen this far. I hope we can entertain you for the remainder of the episode. But also, I feel can like you, can, you, can you restate that again? I want to, I want to get this out. Yeah. Okay, well, Hope, I gather that you believe the Colonel turned Elvis against the Beatles. Uh, we'll never really know, will we? I don't think so. Yeah. No, I but... think, though, that the, the progress that the Beatles represented was something that was stilted in Elvis because of the Colonel. The Colonel's idea of what a star was and how to make a star and be a star was very rooted in this traditional thing, which is like, oh, you're in a Hollywood movie musical, and you know the records are. are join the are army just for a, join the army for two years and get your picture right, taken. The records are just a, 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 a oh, the movie or the movies are a vehicle for the records, whereas it's really the reverse that should be true. So I think that he he ruined Elvis's career in a lot of respects. Because basically he stopped the progress. Elvis's creative progress was stopped, like yeah. right uh, at the army time. I agree with that. Early and, 60s, then it was, and then Tom Parker, yeah, like Colonel. just kind of infiltrated and he, like his his mentality about how Elvis's career should unfold was a, became more and more dated, you know. Mm -hmm. As time went by, you know, Elvis was still making really tacky movies and the Beatles were recording freaking Tomorrow Never Knows, you know? Right. It's just like there was a huge gap between um, progress and what was more modern, what people wanted, and what the Colonel thought. I don't know, what you, what did you think from reading that book? You just don't... Well, it's hard to say Elvis We're talking a about the Peter... Peter uh, uh, Gralnick... Uh, books about Elvis. There's two of them and they're really amazing. That's right. Well, so, are there two chapters? Is it chapter there's one? A, chapter there's two? a early part of Elvis's life, kind of the rise and then the fall. Mm -hmm. Basically up until um, he joins the army and then afterwards. Right. The army was the early 60s, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it was in, he went to Germany and that whole... Yeah. My father knows that whole did. Yeah. You know, like after the Korean War kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Do, <clears> why <throat> do you think that... Elvis was going to hate the Beatles no matter what. Well, it's just that, hate. you know, at least in the telling the book provides, the Colonel and Elvis never discuss anything like the Beatles or even really modern music before right. he meets them. But he gets into this weird point in his life where, you know, he starts really disliking the films he's in and he starts getting right. into kind of pursuing religion in new ways. And he's basically, you know, he's kind of not sold on his whole experience by the time the Beatles roll in. Right, right. And so it's just interesting. He also feels like they don't have the right respect for their fans, apparently. But it's funny because when he meets them, he just kind of sits there and then he starts playing the bass guitar. Right, right. Which is a famous, a famous story. Wait, yeah, Elvis does this? Him. Yeah. Yeah. They when like he, met him backstage. They came to Hollywood and came to his house. Oh, oh right, when the when the Beatles right. came yeah, to the came Beatles to came house. to visit him, right. mm -hmm. and he just sat there playing the bass guitar. Yeah, well, you know, like, uh, I believe that Ringo played some pool, and George went and smoked some pot and talked about Hinduism. Right. And um, the Colonel and Brian Epstein, I guess, gambled. Right, right. And um, Paul and John played music with Elvis reluctantly, and then Elvis declined their invitation to come and visit them. Right. right. I don't know. Either way. I don't think, I think Elvis had that awareness, though, that, look... These movies are trash. I mean, I don't mm. think he didn't know that. But I feel like he was not surrounded with that same musical vibrancy that he was in the early years, you know, where he's in some studios and he's with all these people and they're making these things that are really yeah. new, 
literally we hadn't even ages. really recorded in the studio hardly ever except right. for film soundtracks that's right like almost nothing i had no <clears throat> idea that elvis went so long without recording actual music i guess his right. hand in mine was like the last real record he made before that long spell oh yeah which is a pretty good record i guess yeah, yeah as, 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 as the gospel records small go. elvis. we should listen to some elvis today i think we're gonna have to yeah. Yeah. Watch elvis, elvis, you know, is tough. elvis to me is just like he's <clears throat> He's like a real, in terms of uh, the musical parts of him, it's, I think at the end of the day, he's just a huge disappointment. I mean, he was such a, he, I think he changed now the universe talking. in that I, I personally believe that Elvis created youth culture, literally, because from the time, I could only compare it to like when my mom was a teenager, because prior to Elvis and like, even like Bill Haley and all that stuff, but it was just like kind of, um, there was no music, I think, that was like really locked into being a teenager. Like when you were a teenager in the 30s, like what did that mean? Right. Like you listen I mean, to like big band like, music. Oh, was... age, whatever. No, but this, but <clears throat> rock and roll was something that truly separated the young from the old. It was a trigger. Old. And that's why people nowadays, <laughs> nobody's ever really old anymore. If you came, if you grew up during the time of, of rock music and pop music, you're never really going to be old. Well, unless right. you're Mike Pence, you know. <laughs> unless you want to be old. Yeah. Right. You're always you're going right. to have some youthful element to you because you know, right. you, never, my mom you is, can make fun of your dad, but he was also my mom smoking is, pot and listening to Iron. Yeah, Butterfly. my mom is like seven or something, but she's really into Rod Stewart, and she's like, you know, yeah. it's like you know. <laughs> There's that cool stuff about old people. So right, cool, right. Yeah. My mother was a cool And your, Aaron's mom may or may not have been to all these Van Halen parties in Anaheim. You never know. You never know. My mom, yeah, t had tattoos, super into Janis Joplin. I told her she was going to take us to Woodstock, but we were like little toddlers. And <laughs> like, you know, and the car wouldn't start or whatever it was. I mean, like, so you have this. But Elvis was the one that sort of kicked that. Because people were afraid of him, you right, know. Right. It was just so overtly. All sexual. the screaming and the shrieking and of the t of the kids in the audience, like you've never seen that yeah. before. The hips, hips. Let me get yeah, into the hips. From the hips up. Yeah. <laughs> from the hips up. But musically, he was just a huge <laughs> disappointment. You know, he had some hits and stuff in the beginning, and and we all have a love for some of the kitschy movies. Like I'll sit through Follow That Dream, sure, <laughs> like it, but I think musically. Did he ever make a classic album, Elvis? I don't think so. He right. made. He was a singles artist, yeah. and it just got worse as he went on. And, and he, yeah, he his artistic identity just, I don't know. It became kind of cartoonish and stuff, um, which is a shame because I think he had it in him. You know, look at the tra trajectory of his career versus Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash was making incredible records. Like throughout his career, he was so. Folk I mean, right. mind you, he wasn't as charming and all that stuff as like, like Elvis right. or whatever. But he was a driven, focused <laughs> artist. But yeah, he was really. He was a musician. He was like yeah. a proper musician. And Elvis just kind of got off the rails. I think Tom Colonel Colonel Parker just the Colonel. chased the money. Chased. Well, he was chasing that money hard all right. Oh man, was he chasing? The but money. Elvis also just was like, I'm just going to do whatever the Colonel says. Yeah. Because he'll get me to Hollywood. Like his biggest goal at first, and, right? You know. Right. Yeah. Elvis wasn't a bad actor, though. I'll, I'll give him that. He's like that. Okay, so we're talking about the the designated hitter rule in baseball, DH rule. Me and the shop's only other sports fan, Hope, of uh, the five of us, Hope. Uh, we're talking about big Mets fan, by the way. We're talking about the DH rule. Um, I'm kind of, I, I have no real say. I kind of, there's things I like about the DH rule. There's things uh, I don't like about it. But, uh, but you, you haven't had a burning desire for it to be part of the National League, right? You're never thinking, God, I wish this. No, I, I like the fact that it's different. I like the fact that it makes the leagues different. Right. But right. I don't, you know, seeing a pitcher bat is, you know, professional athletes stand there and do something that he can't do. So it's even when Bart Bartolo Colon would come up to bat, you, it's like, <laughs> what could please the crowd more than that? What are they call, were they calling him Big Sexy? Big Sexy, right? yeah. I think that was in the newspaper the other week. And they're saying that because baseball has kind of, you know, I think it, it's, it's always been a controversy, but, you know, in the, the 80s and 90s, there was work stoppages, and then there was, you know, the cleaning up the game after steroids. This wasn't a real big issue, but seem, things right. seem to be kind of leveled off now. So now it's, now the big issue seems to be how long the game is taking. 
right? It's right. It's a long to watch a baseball right. game, and the thought that maybe you know having pitchers not bat would help with all the switch outs and stuff. Right, right. I but I think you know just to go off on a tangent for a minute, these other things they're thinking about, like as far as doing a. a timer on the pitchers yes. what is it like 20 seconds uh -huh. which i agree with because there's a, there's a couple of these guys notorious you know, like pitch it'll be like a minute guy walks off the mound he's gotta, he'll get his whatever. stuff and do his little like, oh, stupid, yeah. uh, like ocd kind oh, of like yeah. deal yeah. with the rosin not, bag not and touch his that. foot and scratch his do nose you remember there was a guy in the 70s named al raboski they called him the mad was hungarian the the, no throw, this was him would talk to it, so right? he would no that was fidrich when but he, he uh, al raboski you can look at him online he pitched for the cardinals like in the 70s and 80s big handle warm mustache but he had this kind of psych routine which is like he would throw the ball then he would like take his glove off and start just like kind of rubbing the ball together like kind of glaring at the batter it was awesome it was ridiculous i don't know if it was effective well, i think I mean, he made the all-star team once yeah. but but it was just it was it delayed know. the whole game but it had like this sort of charm to it right. these guys now it's just there's none of that fun stuff um, but, <laughs> but anyway, this part of the, the joy of baseball to me for like old people is like, it is that leisurely pay, pace to it. That kind of laid back, right. you know, and you can could, do other things while you watch could a baseball theoretically game. theoretically go on forever. Right. Like there's, right. You can have there's something, well, baseball game and here's the end. thing, look at what's wrong with us compared to like, look at. These guys in their cricket matches overseas right. that last for days, right? I think it's the only like, American sport that doesn't have like a clock. You know, that doesn't, there isn't right. an end to it, like hockey or right. football or basketball. All your idiosyncrasies are just allowed to exist. So I do, I do. So you're saying if the game that. is three hours or three hours and fifteen minutes, at that point, what's the difference? Yeah, who cares? Because they're trying to shave like minutes, and the, they, they track it every year. They're trying to shave oh, yeah. seconds off between the commercial breaks and right, between all the warm-up right. music when the guys woke up to bat and right. But. Right. Oh, yeah. But yeah, watch the uproar if they have to shave the, the, <laughs> the walk on music. Yeah. Um, but I, I like, I like, I, I, and I, and I, this is funny, but I used to play a lot of baseball video games. And I always play as the Mets. And not right. that I'm a baseball manager, but the, the idea of having to think about, like, oh, crap, the video game version of whomever is going to be batting next, I got to, like, switch him out. And do a pinch hitter. Like, I liked right. that. And I have to do, you know, like the thoughts about, I mean, not again, I'm not operating at any kind of high level here. But right. there's some you had thought. to manage. You had to manage. You literally it was had just to like, manage. all right, these are nine guys. Right. Just go swing the bat and we'll see what happens. You know, that's what right. the American League is. You know, it's just right. like. You do that. You, you just throw your cushion down on the bench and you can just sit and watch the game. Right. Um, but I, I think the thing I didn't like about the DH, and this, this might seem really irrational, was the fact that you could... I never liked the idea of a, a baseball player not being able to do everything. As in, well, if you were a slugger, you should be able to field. And one of the people, I, I could never stand this. They used to joke about Prince Fielder like before he retired because he wouldn't run in. If someone bunted, he yeah. would not run in. Right. Like, and I thought, wow, why should this guy be allowed to get away well, with what this? The opposite is like, why should so, a pitcher who can't hit? Right. Right. right, but but at the same time, it's like to me, it was just there was something more authentic about that rule. Like the pitcher, he's out there, and I also didn't like the idea that a DH was was somebody who was like a really one dimensional player, um, who got to oh say he can't field anymore, so you yeah, know he gets this crumb of like what, you know job. like whatever like Don Baylor like this crumb <laughs> of like just being able to hit now right. he doesn't have to do anything else because to me it just seemed like less of a commitment. <laughs> <laughs> so that's I know well, that's what a about this, really what crazy about, way to look What at about it, the though. tension that happens when a pitcher hits a batter, but then the pitcher has to bat? Oh yeah, that's crazy. Because now if you take that off the table, these pitchers can throw anyone with immunity, and they're never going to have to worry oh, about yeah. it. But in the National League, you got to check your back, you know, because if you're throwing at somebody and you're up first, the that's next real inning, baseball. Yeah, that's the good old days. That's I know. <laughs> yeah, now people are going to be charging into the dugout. To go right. take care of that. That ball like, whizzes behind your ear. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I do think, too, it, it does put pressure. Your DH, technically, I mean, is he going to be like your cleanup hitter? I mean, like what, you know. Maybe, maybe not. How, I mean, is he just some guy who bats down at the bottom of the lineup? So I think of it like, I always think for some reason, I always have this vision of like some big softball playing guy that can just stand there <laughs> right. and just like, you know, like a, got a <laughs> club in his hand that can just you know, beat the ball oh, out yeah. of the park. Like, oh, this... Yeah, you just want some some behemoth who's going to just like, you know, kind of... And 
I think too, like there's probably guys who would prefer to be just DHing and not I'm getting paid have the same. Like the, right. pay, the pay raise scale seems to right. be the same. How do you not resent the guy who's <clears throat> doing that job? It's like, well, all he's got to do is hit. I got to run out there and feel. What's yeah. that about? You know. Well, they um, said that but, they may try to do it for 2019, but it's too late. I mean, pitchers and catchers are coming in a few days. Oh, like, yeah. There's no way. Oh, no, not now. Oh. Not now. But you remember in the old days how shortstops and second basemen were not expected to be able to hit? Yeah. They yeah. just had to, don't make any errors. <laughs> yeah. You know, and they were the, like the, the, the skinniest, littlest, littlest guys. Oh, totally. And they could never, they couldn't do any. They were the ones, they were bunting yeah. um, no matter what the situation was. <laughs> So in, to, to sum this up, I hope you're against the universal I, DH, is what it's called. Yeah, I'm, I am yeah. against it, but I think that... I like it's, how it's like the universal health care. It's called universal DH. Is but like I would like topic. to say Noah Syndergaard agrees with me. Right. So, but and I'm I, kind of on the fence. I, I don't, I don't, I don't care much about baseball anymore to have this be a big deal for yeah, me. Yeah, I hate to be a, a purist. This is why I can't watch hockey hardly anymore. I hate all the rule changes since the 80s. Yeah. <laughs> It's okay, so, so today's episode, we're doing, talking a lot about sports, because it's me and Hope here in the shop on a slower than normal Sunday afternoon, and uh, me and Hope are the two sports fans, and Hope was just describing her love affair with the New York Islanders, the hockey team started in Long Island uh, in the early 70s, yeah. so can you describe what you yeah, just told yeah. me? <laughs> I, I, I would let, you know, most people, I think a kid... Now it's it's like oh without Morrissey I would have gotten through high school. <laughs> For me it was that hockey team which is really weird because you weren't supposed to like sports and music they were like right. mutually exclusive. How did you find the scores yeah. of games like is it reading the newspaper the next day to find that if they beat Winnipeg? No, I mean well this is this is the difference between okay, so. By the time the late seventies arrived, you know cable TV was the George was Michael there. sports machine. Yeah. <laughs> So Islander games were were broadcast like there were 80, you know, the seasons were 80 games. I never missed a game. I think from the time I was probably like maybe like uh, mid 70s, like on through like into the on into the 80s. I never missed a game. And at that time in the, of the world, if there was an away game in a faraway place, it would be on Channel 9. Right. At like 11 p.m., but yeah. sometimes the games weren't, and I remember listening to the Islanders versus Vancouver on the radio. <laughs> Hockey um, on the radio. Yeah, That's can insane. you freaking imagine? <laughs> um, but I kept really, uh, I kept scrapbooks every game, box scores, and because I was on Long Island, obviously Newsday, the Rangers were not the important team; <laughs> the Islanders were. Uh, scrapbooks. Uh, and also in the newspaper, like if the Islanders were at any local shopping mall, had to be there. Didn't care which player it was, had to be there. Um, went to all the practices all the time at Cantiac Park, made my mom. It was freezing cold, miles away. Outdoors? Oh, no, it was indoors. It might as well have been outdoors. <laughs> um, it was just like this really grungy rink. Um, and so anytime a puck would fly over and grab it, I had broken sticks and all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, I was also in a couple of fan clubs, and <clears throat> one of them was for Bob Nystrom, who was a very beloved Islander. Yeah, Bob Nystrom. And uh, I, we went to away games, so went to like Boston Garden and... Hartford to see Islanders versus was the he Whalers. One of the guys that had, had like a bald head and like a mustache. Was he one no, of those no, like old, he was, old timers that didn't wear a helmet? Like no, that? he didn't wear a helmet, but he was like the heartthrob of the time. <laughs> okay. For real. And um and I thought I was cool because I got to know some of these guys, so they knew my name and everything. Whoa. Even though I'd gotten their autograph like ten thousand billion times. I was a loser, make no mistake though. <laughs> you know, but I had a few several jerseys at home to choose from to wear to wow. various events. And autographs and everything, but they were, they were like my lifeline, literally. And it seems really funny now because I kind of lost interest as I got into, started to go to school in New York City. And also, as they but, kind of ran into the the buzzsaw. Oh, then they the, sucked. Then Gretzky, they ran into the Gretzky yeah. buzzsaw, and that was the end of they, the. They they won four in a row, right? Yeah, they, they won four in a row. They're the they're probably the most forgotten um, dynasty. <laughs> there were I think there's like five Hall of Famers on the team. Yeah. Um, 
I remember the whole Pot Van Sucks thing <laughs> in in real time. I know the the chance oh, of the Ranger Hood Cup, the nineteen forty oh, chance. Oh, terrible. And, oh yeah, yeah. It's still it, the amazing thing is like if you go to see the Rangers <laughs> now, there's now that people are still doing that. Oh, Pot Van Sucks. You know, because he broke Ulf Nilsson's ankle. You know, and Ulf Nilsson at that time too, Swedish players were regarded as being really fragile, like made of glass. It's like, oh, don't hurt the Swedish player. You know, they weren't tough. Pod Everything has changed. <laughs> yeah, and Podvin also, you know, he made the mistake of he was he was like the intellectual of the team, you know, because he went to art museums and they really right. made a big production of this, and so he was especially hated because he was like a smarty pants guy. Right. Right? He was like the Keith Hernandez of you know. Very, right. well, um, Ron I remember Darling. I remember meeting him as a kid at a car dealership <laughs> in Syosset. <laughs> And he was wearing a like a brown cardigan sweater, yeah. Um, but that's that's the kind of you know. Where was your brother yeah. this whole time? Was he a fan? He just tagged along. He didn't care. He didn't no. care. I don't. Right. I know that I can't. I I never asked him like if he thought I was too obsessive, but he always had to get dragged along into <laughs> it, and I felt kind of bad. Not into the fan club stuff. He definitely drew the line there. Right. Um, he was, you know, he was a skateboarder, so he was much cooler to me. Did, um, you said That's, you saw the, the second Stanley Cup? The second Cup. cup. Oh, get this. Uh, this I, was 81-82 season. 81-82 season. So 70, <laughs> so 79 they won, 80 was the first one? Uh, no, I thought it was 70. 79-80, yeah. It was Islanders and Flyers, and my man Bob Nystrom scored the overtime goal. Let's right. not forget that one. So the second one, Long Island, the... Um, electrical company out there used to be called Lilco, Long yeah, Island yeah, Lighting yeah. Company. Okay. <laughs> so they were giving away tickets to that game. What? Okay, to that that Stanley this, Cup game. This is the one they, they won it. Yeah, Islanders and North Stars. They were already ahead like three games to one, whatever. And I was like, oh, mom, mom, we have to enter. We got to enter. And she did. And we freaking won the tickets. Couldn't Whoa. believe it. We won the tickets. So we got to sit down. My brother, once again, dragged him. Didn't care. Um, so got to see them win the second cup and wow. was excited too. Cause I saw my social studies teacher there. Um, it's <laughs> just like really, and we say there, we're talking Nassau, Nassau Coliseum, Coliseum. I have very, still unbelievably still exists. I listen, I won't. I... <laughs> so we were, we were talking about the Nassau Coliseum, which I think is one of the lamest uh, examples. Uh, it's a terrible place to watch. In I mean, it's not terrible because it's so small. Yeah. But you, you go in there and you're like, this is a professional grade arena. Like I can't, I can't well, believe professional teams won championships here. I'm going to counter that with, what if it was the only place you ever saw things happen at? <laughs> so right. to you, like, and when I say to you, I mean to me, it was, I couldn't be more excited when I set foot in that place for anything. There was just like one portal. Like you walked in. <clears throat> That's and right. And seats were either up from there or down from and there. There wasn't different levels of mezzanine tiers yeah, why do we and need loge different levels? boxes yeah. and stuff. What's wrong with simplicity? I remember Shea Stadium. Like I remember, oh my God. Loge boxes. <laughs> loge. Yeah. Um, all I cared about at Shea was getting box seats because if you didn't have box seats, you couldn't get autographs. What but, I cared about shapes running up and down those ramps at the end of it. <laughs> and those plexiglass, like orange, oh my those God. plexiglass squares. Running oh. up and down those ramps with my friends. That's what I cared about at Shea. And the best Shea Stadium reference, or, or I went to a game, it must have been the early 80s, when um, it was uh, Dave Kingman was still uh, oh, yeah. still still owned the city. <laughs> Surly and, Dave <laughs> Kingman. Yeah, there was a yeah. day, it was, like, it was, uh, it was um, seat cushion night. <laughs> and but you have to be eighteen again. These like those those like they're maybe a foot by a foot. They're the foam seat cushions. Yeah. And we, um, we couldn't get them. Me and my friend because we were under eighteen. My dad probably took us to the game, and we couldn't get them because we we're under eighteen. Well, Dave King struck out like four times that game. Right. That's With like runners on base, <laughs> yeah. all the things they could have won, and they didn't. At the end of the game, and I remember it was late into the evening. It's one of those dreary Met games, like into the hot August night. I remember being under, you know, on, on one of the levels where there was a level above us. So there was like, right, a, right. we were kind of under a level above us. Right. Remember the lights? King Kong, Kingman comes up, hits like the most meaningless home run ever. And then the, <laughs> you know, the score was like nine to two or something. It was like, so everyone just sarcastically, this whole stadium threw all these seat cushions. And they were, it was awesome. raining, raining. Me and my friend walked out of there with like 10 each holding like pizza boxes. 
And we still, I still have one or two at my house. And on the back, it's like oh, that's some so hot dog awesome. company that met, that that uh, some long begone hot dog company right. though, like some <laughs> right. really crazy sponsor, like you know Schaefer. The ballpark Franks. Yeah, Schaefer sponsor. <laughs> Schaefer, the beer to have when you're having more than uh, one. Was it Schaefer? Or was it Rheingold? I mean, they had <laughs> yeah, yeah. a couple of winners with the Mets. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was my favorite Shea Stadium. I moment. wish I could have seen that. You I know, I used to go to Bat Day too, and. There was a point where, like, I think they, you know, at Yankee Stadium, where there was, you know, they would like, all right, fans, everyone hold up your bats. And everyone oh, would yeah. hold the bats up. And it was an amazing sight to see tens of thousands of bats held up. But then I think someone realized, like, wait a minute, we're giving oh, yeah. all these kids bats. Yes. Maybe, and they were real because... bats. They were bats you could use in games. They were real wooden. Like, they weren't the, And then they gave yeah. out... Those little, the, the even more weaponized ones, the smaller ones. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they did that at Shea, too. I remember swinging that little <laughs> bat around. Yeah, sure, you could kill a fish with it, but you could also kill people yeah. with that thing. But, I know. It seems insane now that, that they, they would gave, do that. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, hey, but you're I went to Nassau. Knife well, day. I went to Knife <laughs> <laughs> day. Chavo yeah. presents Switchblade day. <laughs> no. I went to... Uh, um, more innocent times. Yeah. I, I saw Pink Floyd at Nassau Coliseum. I saw... Um, a couple other concerts there, but I remember when my son was really young, we went to a monster truck show out there, and it was so loud and so smoke choked and so like the people that were there. And this was like you know kind of <laughs> Long Island's finest. You know you're at a monster truck yeah. now in Long Island. I mean who are you drawing? Yeah, but it was so loud because the place um, was so small. <clears throat> and it was, it was like you know tall truckosaurus. Like Simpsons oh. bullshit. It was like it was. It. I could just was, imagine the smoke because that place was small. And you know, for the longest time, I, I always remember this going to all those hockey games. The attendance was always fourteen thousand nine hundred and ninety-five. You know, right. like that was the limit. Yeah. And, um, and when they moved to Brooklyn, they, the stadium was small. Terrible. It's and, awful. And they had to get a waiver from the NHL to play in that stadium. There's, obstru uh, there's visually the obstru obstructed yeah. seats, and it's also at this really precarious angle. Yeah. It's, it's not I've sat upstairs hockey at, arena. I've, I've sat upstairs yeah. in the Brooklyn Arena, and it's like really, really steep. Yeah. But yeah, I've lost, you know, they, they, they changed the, their uniforms for a while. Then it was know like what? a crazy sailor Here's on the, the front. Like yeah. The, that's... Uh, the Gordon's fish <laughs> guy. Yeah. <laughs> the, the problem is, like, people they were there's so much a part of long island and it was a very sad thing to me when they moved away and i i do have nostalgic feelings about the coliseum and i still like i would if we drove to long island right now i'd be like let's go look at the coliseum mm -hmm. just sit in the parking lot i mean i and i saw my first concerts there and stuff and i yeah i know it wasn't a glamorous <laughs> <laughs> arena but you didn't need that because the, the the team was just so good, and but I, they were so, they were so entrenched in in Long Island culture. That's why I'm glad they're yeah. going back. I wish they well, weren't they, they to Elmont, to, yeah, to a different place. They're building a different but, arena, yeah. right? Or they're, they're building yeah. a new arena, or yeah, it's going to be a different arena. But they play some games um, at the Coliseum now, like oh, really? a few a year. So they did last week, and oh, people were going crazy. Did you know for it. a long time too? Freaking the Quebec Nordiques, okay? Yeah. The poor Quebec, right? Quebec lost their NHL team. What yeah. was this in the 90s or yeah. something? So there's this group of fans that were trying to get another NHL franchise uh -huh. to come there. Oh, no. And see, so they kind of honed in on the Islanders. Oh, they're like no. trying to take our team, all these freaking. <laughs> yeah, there was people. all those teams that left from like Winnipeg to go to like Atlanta and right. Nashville, and which I still can't Florida. get my head around. You know, right. I want the Atlanta Flames back. You know, and <laughs> yeah. freaking you know, bring back the Nordiques and you know, just all that kind of That's stuff. The, but yeah. there's like four teams in Florida or something. I just and then you ever right. meet. Every once in a while, I'll open the paper and like look at the divisions. <laughs> it's like I don't even know what the remember there used to be oh, the no, Norris, Smythe. the Patrick, yeah. the Smythe, oh, yeah. the Norris, and the uh, I was say it? it was it was the uh, Patrick Smythe um, Norris and. Um, Oh gosh, what was it? Uh, I have to look it up. Is it Atlantic? I can't really no, no, remember. No, now it's like the I Metropolitan. I know. It's just kind of all over Don't the like place. Don't like it. Don't like it. And if we're speaking about rule changes, this is yeah. one thing I absolutely detest, which is this shootout crap yeah. in the NHL, which is people getting a point for losing. Right. Which is like it a, just a shouldn't loss be. In the overtime. Absolutely overtime loss not. Gets more, just kind of artificially trying right. to make it more exciting. Hockey, by well, nature, is exciting. It's a thousand times more exciting than a soccer game. You remember? But, remember yeah. when it was uh, there were twenty one teams and sixteen teams made the playoffs. Oh yeah, the good old days. <laughs> Freaking loved it. But you know what? The cream always rose, and I say yeah. this because my team was the best. Yeah. So yeah, I know everyone's like, "What the hell is like, this how about?" Do you not make the I know. So you'd get like, yeah, I know that there were there were crappy 
teams that would kind of <coughs> slink in there. But <laughs> but it's a it's a really different game now. But I think it's it's important to acknowledge like the Islanders were one of the greatest teams in history. Yeah. You know, whenever people talk about oh the Rangers and Messier, I'm like no no not even a patch on that. And because <coughs> it was a rough league back then, it was. I mean, there were guys oh yeah, but still there were. Oh yeah, there were. D- Brutal. It was it was, it was much more brutal and like oh, they yeah. were only on the ice to not even touch the puck. Well, that was the whole remember because the Flyers, their whole reputation, yeah, the Broad Street, Street bullies, yeah. like every guy on that team wanted to kick your yeah. ass. <laughs> and there were the Islanders had a couple of guys like that where you knew if the big enforcer for the Bruins was this guy named Terry O'Reilly, and we had Clark Gillies. You knew <laughs> it was going to go down at some point in the evening. And uh, it's funny There's because like, two like sharks circling each other oh, on yeah, the ice, and like yeah. you know, kind of chipping at each other. It was going to be. It and was going to yeah. get dark. And we had and our goalie Billy Smith. He was just a bastard, and he really was. He wasn't. And I will say <laughs> this, chopped. even from a fan perspective, he was never really friendly to all of us. Like I could, he was always like, "Get out of the way!" You know, he's definitely an uptight guy. Chopping ankles in front of the um, goal. And oh stuff. yeah, I was swinging that <laughs> stick around. Yeah, he's always mixing it up. He kind of like, and people hated him for it. Um, <laughs> And they also had a, the other goalie. Do you remember Chico Resch? Yeah. <laughs> you know why they called him Chico? No. This is so terrible. He was bald and he wore a hairpiece. <laughs> and they thought it made him look like he was Mexican. So they called him Chico Resch for years and years. He did like in, in our newsday, the newspaper, the, the TV guide on the weekend. He, he was in like a hair transplant mm-hmm. ad and everything it's like really go and you think about offensive. like back when there were 16 six teams for the longest time and the rangers still couldn't win when there was just six teams you know it's like you know the whole 1940 the thing it took, it took forever yeah, i remember I, watching in 1994 i was going to school in missouri and i was actually into it that year even though mm-hmm. I, was, I was away i was out i was kind of watching it more and more and we were watching on the news and a friend of mine we moved out there together and we went to the bar to watch all the games, like in the playoffs. And I'd never gotten into hockey, but I was kind of swept into this. I was in Missouri, but I was like swept into like this like feeder pitch about the Rangers winning the Stanley Cup, which was at the time pretty, you know, pretty neat. I, it was, I never, I can't, um, just like uh, any sane Jet fan could never root for the Patriots. Like I could never root for the Rangers. Just couldn't happen. <laughs> You know, just diametrically opposed. And, and the Devils were at a bunch every of end. titles. The, the Devils, Devils were good. I don't really rate the Devils because they're an expansion <laughs> team to me, right? They weren't they the Ro- the Colorado the Rockies? Rockies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like any team that that didn't exist prior to 1980, I don't feel like is a real team. <laughs> so like things that have like movie tie-ins or you know, right. or in cities with minor league baseball teams, they're not really <laughs> hockey teams. They're just or cities where the average temperature is 80 degrees. Yeah, if you get a cartoon character, is your freaking yeah, <laughs> right? I know it's just. That's what that's why people always thought the L, didn't take the L.A. Kings seriously for a long time because they they were just like oh they're a California team or, they, yeah they they won I mean, a couple years ago didn't they yeah yeah they, yeah. they had a Gretzky yeah. was Gretzky was with them for a while yeah yeah he um he kind Hollywooded legit, them legitimized them um, because they were they were yellow and <coughs> yellow and purple purple for a long time. complementary colors doesn't really inspire you know fear. yeah but then they went to that black you know the whole like you know. 90s kind of like you know games yeah. direct they went to black and purple like the ravens kind of that's a lot, you know lot more aggressive looking i know uh, unnecessary also <laughs> unnecessary you know the yeah. best jerseys were yeah. the old uh, vancouver oh the, yeah the, the v, oh the i remember that flying v on the chest i literally remember that the big change <laughs> when they when they made that they right. were like that was like the astros of the nhl <laughs> yeah. you know and my favorite and logo, now everybody loves it of yeah. course yeah one of my favorite logos so. of all time in sports is the hartford whale the whale. Oh yeah, that's the just best like one the, with the great tail. logo. It has like the fish in it and like the whale oh, yeah. tail and yeah. that was one of my favorite. And they were in a mall at one point, like late in their career, they were practicing, they were playing their games in like, a saw shopping them. mall or something. I but saw them play in think. their um, original <coughs> arena, and Hartford. Hartford, um, yeah, and they. It was weird to me. Like I, I always look at all these other teams as like pretend teams because I was so spoiled because our team was so good. <laughs> And I think I was telling you I saw um, the, that injury again. <laughs> so a topic that comes up a lot in the shop and, and when music comes on, when it's guilty pleasure music is the phrase, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is my guilty pleasure. You know, people say <laughs> this is, oh, Blink-182 comes on, oh, but, but this is my guilty pleasure so I can get away with it. And 
Hope, hope has taught me to, to kind of remove that word from my vocabulary and just to own it. I like Blink-182, therefore I listen to them. <laughs> yeah. Guilty pleasure, kind of like, it's kind of this fake way of saying, you know, I'm, I'm better than this. Right, and, right, you know, right. It always seems to come up in it's, music. It's always, it's a, it's and people t- always present it so sheepishly. You know, it's like, to me, the word guilty pleasure, the expression needs to be kind of thrown out the window. Because you like what you like, right? You can't help it. It's, it's internal wiring. And I respect somebody so much more if they don't start off. Usually when you're talking <laughs> to somebody and they about a song they, that right. you, they think you might not think is cool, they always start with like, look, I know this is lame, but, yeah. right? And I, I will always stop them right there and say, it's not lame. If you love it, then, you know, it's yeah. yours. Freaking, you know, stand, hold but your head up high. Hold guilty your pleasure. Head up high come in um, it, like what, what else is it used movies, movies like, i think or, or like, tv movie. shows or whatever right. but it's almost i don't know like I, i've always found it really odd and then there's you know then there's this whole business of guilty pleasures like if you go on spotify it's like oh a guilty pleasure playlist and, right right right. and i don't right. believe in like kind of brandishing that like, <laughs> you know that be you should be ashamed of that you should only like it for its kitsch value because I'll tell you something, if I was putting together my top 10 albums of all time, I will say that, yeah, probably that Christopher Cross record with sailing on it's going to be there. I mean, I like plenty of cool things, but it's just like if right. I'm being brutally honest about something I still want to listen to. Yeah. And I don't and I don't care what people think, you know, you got to I think you got to let go of that. You have to let go of right. it. Never apologize if you like something, you know, and be prepared to. And if you do own it, you have to be prepared for the abuse. So like <laughs> when Aaron's in here trying to tell us how great Primus are, well, I'm going to push back on that. Be like, no, they're freaking terrible. And <laughs> what's wrong with you? This is what your brother's talking about. Talking smack. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just, but that's okay. That's okay. Like I, I said in the last thing, you know, I like so much cheesy stuff. I love Kenny Loggins and you know, freaking Olivia Newton-John, and I could tell you which records were good and bad and stuff, but I don't care who knows. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's just like, um, but yeah, you got to just, own you got to own it. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And you have to, own, yeah. I, I find that we talked about this in the last episode, like owning it with somebody here, like a buddy to own it with is kind of helpful. And this is what I'm talking about here <laughs> being in the shop environment. You need like a, like a buddy. So when the whistle blows, and the bullies are coming. You have someone whose hand you can hold. It's kind, kind of, of like, like your your AA sponsor. Yeah, you know, <laughs> like just kind of to pull pull you through. Going through a little rush thing right now with Aaron, but we're going through it together. Uh, yeah, you know, and, and we're, we're able to defend it you know, pretty pretty good. Um, I'll still defend I, it. Everclear, uh, I think me and Aaron might there be on, you go. We might Perfect. be on the same page there. And Everclear again, I would always say, oh, it's a guilty pleasure. Oh, it's a guilty pleasure. But you know, now that you know, now that I've I've learned to take that out of my vocabulary and just kind of own it, it's like. Yeah, Everclear, man. I mean, there, yeah. you know, and it's like you start thinking about, we were talking more about like covers and, you know, the Weezer album that's out <laughs> with all the cover songs and they're just kind of like reenactments uh. of the other songs. You know, they're just kind of like, you know, faithful reproductions in a lot of ways. It's yeah. not, cl- I don't think it's clever and, you know, I, who am I to judge? It's... But when, when Toto came out or when they came out, you know, the fan was like, oh, would you please, you know, the eight-year-old right, you know, right. kid or whatever was like, oh, right. please do Africa and like, we're going to start a hashtag and, you know, months go by and Toto releases Rosanna. Right. Well, kind of clever. Like, I, I felt like, aha, you know, very clever. Right. You know, you, 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 oh, we did the wrong song. Oh, my gosh. And then Africa followed close on the heels. Right. And then this fucking album follows even closer on the heels. And it's just like, right. you know. It seems it seems really it's kind not, of um, cynical and disingenuous. You yeah, know, it's like, like, well, if we had, we're in the like, news because yeah. we did, you know, we're popular because we, you know, like, again, what people are talking about us because we did these one or two yeah. covers. Let's do 10 of them. Then they'll talk about it's like 10 right. times as much. You know, and this this kind of goes back to something that happened a couple of years ago where Ryan Adams covered this entire Taylor Swift record. And everyone was like, and she's like, oh my God, this is so amazing, you know. Um, and because he was sort of a credible artist and all this stuff. And what happened was a couple of weeks later, Father John Misty, another very um, polarizing indie artist, did a cover of a song off that record as a statement to say, look, if you do this kind of thing, people are just going to write about it. You know, why are you doing it? 
what's the reason behind it right and it's so to fast forward to now that's kind of a, a similar thing with Weezer but it just proves that you know their their lack of imagination and they're not bringing anything to it right. and we talked about this this is very where, rote versions right. I know and I know we're going to go back to yeah. Everclear this so, is going back to Everclear when it, you hear their covers they're for better or for worse and generally for worse <laughs> Those are Everclear songs. You hear the boys are back in town when Everclear does it? Yeah. Man, it's Everclear's version. There's they no, they no, Everclear it. No, <laughs> yeah. There's no the, void space. There's no there's no no, oh, no. no sound wave left untouched. No. There's no you know, the you know, when you listen to the original it makes you appreciate the original when you listen to the thin rig- oh, thin the original. Oh, Boy, does it ever. It's it's like drinking fine wine <laughs> compared to the Everclear version, which is like warm. Yeah, it's like flat flat beer. soda, <laughs> flat tab or something. But it's an Everclear song. They kind of and that what the no. Space Cowboy, that's another Everclear mm-hmm. song that they cover. Mm-hmm. It's kind of nuts and it's really weird and he talks and he's really Oh the drunk. Joker, right. It's yeah. it's uh, yeah, the Joker, I'm sorry, yeah. the Joker. Um it's kind of it's it's definitely unique. It's like yeah. it's a unique take. Actually, on Actually, people should listen to that because the <laughs> the dialogue in it is absolutely horrifying. Uh, that's Everclear doing the Joker. Um, you're gonna if you can get through it, good on you. But I mean, they do make when they do a cover version, it sounds like an Everclear song, <laughs> and that's what when you're doing a cover of something, either you you want to kind of dissect it a little. You don't want to make it sound exactly like the original. A recreation. And the thing about even um, uh, the Weezer versions, it reminds me of like bringing your laundry to the laundromat. You know, yeah. just, your clothes get clean, but they don't really smell like anything, right? <laughs> you just you just know they're clean. You know, there's nothing to kind of make them stand out. Whereas right. with with Everclear, they did that thing that a lot of bands do, which is like. Hey, we're in the 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 twilight of our career. Let's do a cover album of songs that inspired us to become a band. Right. And even Rush, Rush did it. Has Everybody one of those. does it. Oh god. Everybody does yes, it. Everybody does it. Yes. And the best Eric, well, the Eric <laughs> story that Aaron always tells is that he, I guess when Aaron was working, Aaron Aaron from the shop was working in Portland, or well, was living in Portland, and I think he worked at a bagel shop, or maybe it was even in California. <laughs> Where I think Art Alexis was a, a regular customer, oh, God. and basically he was pulled aside by the manager and told, "Whatever you do, don't ask Art about his music," because apparently that was <laughs> that would set him off. And Aaron really? never—I don't think he ever interacted with him in any way. But like somehow, was it because he didn't want to be recognized as an artist? Oh, uh, you know, it's, or uh, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like I, mean, a, I don't know if I tell us a little more. I mean, we should probably get him on to yeah. talk about that. But yeah, there was this thing about like you know he's you know don't just you know just don't treat him like everyone else. Don't ask him about his music and doing it. Oh my God! Um, but anyway, I yeah. Well, <laughs> it's funny because like when you were playing that Everclear record all the time, I was like, I, all my initial Wait, reaction was my my bias was, oh man, this is terrible. I hate this, but I had to give it to them because they because of what they did to it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah that Art's boy's like drunkenly like talking Jesus. about his teenage daughter. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, the, I'm telling you. You can tell um, it's a Vegas crowd. You can tell they're talking about like the people up at the $20 He was tables. just drunk like, on his own charisma, basically, <laughs> which is never a good good look for anyone. But well, His look has always been like the blonde hair <laughs> with the goatee, right? That's like that's the look. If we're oh, yeah. About. Oh, God. Everclear were, ne- they were they were cool for about one minute. They had a couple of daddy songs, you know, a couple, couple of daddy, daddy songs, songs, you know, yeah. a couple of like, you know, they had the cool, the coolest song in Romeo and Juliet. Right. Oh, ding, God. Ding, 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 you know, it's uh, um, local, local heroes, local gods, local, local gods. God. Yeah. yeah. Which great is really song. hard to find. Great That's song. a great, really weird point. I, I think it's that. a really weird guitar tuning or something. Oh, about yeah, it. yeah. It's really like Very it stays in your head. I remember when Hope came to work here, we connected on that song and we tried to, I remember trying to find it like, oh yeah, it's called Local Gods, I believe. But yeah, it's on the Romeo and Juliet. Uh, it's the, the Leonardo DiCaprio yeah. version of that movie, right? But yeah, that's that why, to, to you know, just to circle back, like, so when people say, you should never be embarrassed if you if you like something. I think it's I think it's okay. And, and once again, back in my record store days, you would get people coming up to you with, like, serious questions, like, <laughs> how's the new Celine Dion? And I could answer that question, you know, like I, I would listen to it. You never made, you know, you don't want to make people feel stupid for right. what they, what they well, like. It's like in the bike shop. You don't want to yeah. make someone feel bad right. about the bike they roll in on. Right. Oh, wow. Where'd you get that? That's it's cool. Like, oh, that's great. Teal. That's a great color. Yeah. Wow. This, this thing's are still <laughs> yeah. running, huh? I yeah. always say when it's a really old, really old crappy bike, I'll say something <laughs> like, um, 
you know, it was designed like 40 years ago to last like five years. And here, and here it is, you know, we're, you know, it, it's made it through all this stuff and, you know, it's a badge of honor. I know that's thing such a backhanded <laughs> compliment. It's yeah. just, it really, it, it, it shouldn't be here. This bike shouldn't, the shit bike should be like in a scrap heap somewhere, but this bike is still here. Right. Right. And it's, you know, <laughs> I think it's, it's kind of positive, but, uh, well, no, no, it, I think, I think it is. I think that's, a, I like that one actually. <laughs>